Good evening, everybody. Let's take out our Bibles. We're going to be 2 Timothy. We're starting a new book study now, as was mentioned. So we're going to be 2 Timothy here here on Wednesday nights. If you're new, we go uh, through a a particular book of the Bible verse by verse. A little different than on Sundays. We go more thematically through chapters at a time. But on Wednesday nights, we go verse by verse. And so we're starting a new book study together. So if you need a Bible, you can raise your hand and receive a Bible from one of our ushers and then make your way to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy. I'm gonna give uh, a little bit of, a, of an introduction because we're starting a new book together and so it's always good to get a little bit of perspective, get a little bit of a, of a, uh, of a background to the book and then we'll pray and we'll see if we can get through chapter one, maybe even through a little bit of chapter two tonight, so we'll see. So for those of you who like to take notes, a little bit of information on 2 Timothy. This is a continuation of the pastoral epistles. If you were here for our study of 1 Timothy, you will remember that there are three letters that Paul writes to uh, Timothy, two letters to Timothy and one letter to Titus. Uh, These are both men in the first century who were pastors, and so Paul, as kind of the spiritual dad, is giving them some wisdom and doctrine and helping them to understand how to pastor churches and what the church should be about, what it should look like. So 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and then the book that follows this, Titus, are all considered pastoral epistles. How, how is the church supposed to be pastored? How is a church supposed to function together? Um, this book was written by Paul about five to six years after 1 Timothy. So When we've turned the page from last week's study to today, we're advancing about five or six years. And it's important to note that something different from when Paul wrote 1 Timothy, now Paul is in prison as he writes 2 Timothy. And he's writing from a prison in Rome, and the year is around 67 AD. Um, Something also important to realize about this letter is that this is basically Paul's farewell letter. Uh, He knows that his own death is imminent. He will say at the end of this uh, 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 book here in chapter 4, verse 6, that he he knows that his time is near. And uh, this will then be the final letter that Paul writes. You know, of the New Testament, of 27 books in the New Testament, Paul writes uh, roughly two-thirds. Uh, And so, even though you are reading through your New Testaments and you come here to 2 Timothy and you say, well, there's there's a lot more to go. Of course, there's some other writers left to go. We have James, we have uh, John, we have Jude, Uh, but this is Paul's last letter. So again, not everything in your Bible is in chronological order. This is the last letter that he will write before he dies. He knows that his time is short because something historically happened and is the reason why Paul is in prison here. In 64 AD, just a few years before Paul will be executed, and I guess I should put that last point up as well, Emperor Nero will execute him roughly 67, 68 AD. Uh, the, the fourth century historian Eusebius, he writes in his writings, Chronicles, that Paul is executed by Nero in Nero's 14th year of his reign. So Nero is one of the emperors of Rome, and Eusebius, the historian, says that in the 14th year of Nero's reign, he executes Paul. Paul will be beheaded. And the reason behind this this vitriol against not just Paul, but all of Christianity at this particular time is because something happened in the year 64 AD, just a few years before Paul was executed, and that is Rome burned. Now, what does that have to do with Christianity and the the eventual execution of Paul, because Tacitus, the first century historian, says that Emperor Nero set Rome on fire. Now, there's a lot of dispute. You read history books, there's a lot of dispute. Did Nero really burn? And and so, if you remember your history in school, you know that apparently Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Well, the fiddle wasn't invented until afterwards, so he didn't really fiddle. He, he, He might have, you know, I don't know, play the banjo or some other hick an instrument. But, uh, but anyway, uh, that, that's my bias coming out there. But anyhow, whatever he did or didn't do, Tacitus, first century historian, says Nero set Rome on fire because Nero had wanted to do a whole rejuvenation project in Rome. This whole renovation, a whole new, you know, 
uh, fixer-upper project. He wanted it to go across HGTV and the whole deal. And, and the Roman Senate knocked it down, said that's too much money, we're not going to refurbish and, and renovate Rome. So Tacitus, the historian says, so Nero, maybe himself not, but he had somebody light Rome on fire. Ten out of the 14 precincts of ancient Rome were destroyed. So there had to be a renovation project. But Christians became a scapegoat for why Rome burned. Nero blamed it on the Christians. And as a result, they not only were blamed for Rome burning in 64 AD, they were persecuted for it. They were rounded up, and they were imprisoned, they were martyred, they were tortured. You, you read history, Nero was um, a pretty wicked emperor, and he even would dip Christians alive in tar, and then he would light them on fire as torches in his garden. So this kind of persecution is happening. Now this is an important backdrop to what we're about to read here because four times Paul's gonna use, in four chapters, he's gonna use the word suffering. Uh, because when we talk about suffering, as, as I'll, I'll restate this, we have no idea what suffering for Christ is. Not here, not in America, not in the comfort of Loudoun County for sure. We have no concept whatsoever. But when this letter's being written, as the last letter that, penned Paul's by, that uh, Paul pens by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, there is tremendous persecution against Christians happening. And Paul gets rounded up as part of, as part of that persecution, and he gets thrown in prison uh, where he is here and where he will then, uh, he'll never get out, he'll eventually then be executed by Nero. And a little bit further about his conditions, he is being kept in what is historically referred to as the Mamertine or the Mamertine prison in Rome, and it was originally a cistern. So it was just a huge hole in the ground, it had no windows, it was subterranean, and it had a, um, a cover over the hole, and they would lower prisoners into the hole, and they would lower food for the prisoners, uh, but, but that's his condition. And it's basically a dungeon, and he is in chains. So, you know, I don't know why you have to put, the guy's already, you know, below ground in a hole. I don't know why you have to also chain him, but just as extra security, he's in chains. And he refers to his chains in chapter 2, in verse 9, and in verse 8, actually, backing up, it's, he says, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descended from David. This is my gospel, verse 9, for which I am suffering even to the point of being chained like a criminal. And chapter 4, verse 13, uh, tells us at the end of his letter, he makes a request to Timothy. He says, can, can you uh, bring my cloak? Uh, because the conditions of where he is being imprisoned are damp and cold. So he even requests, can you bring me a coat? So he's, he is suffering for the gospel. He's imprisoned. He's in this cold, damp, windowless um, prison, just an abandoned cistern. And he's going to live out his few days left in this prison, and then he's going to be pulled out and executed. So that also gives weight to this letter, doesn't it? Because I want you to think for a moment that if you knew you were about to die, and it was clear to Paul, he knew it. He, he just knew it was a matter of time. If you knew that you were about to die, what would be some of the last things you would ever want to say? What are some of the most important things that you would want, that you would want to put down on paper? Because 2 Timothy are the final counsel of a dying man. That's what these chapters are, the final counsel of a dying man. And so it's not that we should, you know, consider this weightier than any other part of Scripture, but only in the sense that this is coming from the heart of a man who knows that he's dying, and what are some of the most important final parting words that you would want to say if you knew you were dying? Because that's what we have here before us.
And so let's pray, and then we're going to dig out, uh, Lord willing, uh, chapter one here together and, uh, and see how far we get, maybe even to chapter two tonight. But let's first just pray together. Father, as we come before you now tonight, we just want to open up 2 Timothy with fresh eyes to be able to see what you would want to say to us tonight. And Lord, we're just thankful for your grace, and we appreciate our comfort, Lord, but yet we want to be mindful that there are many people who are suffering around the world for their faith. And so we pray for them tonight, and we think of the example of Paul and many of the martyrs uh, before us that have made it possible for us to enjoy the kind of freedom that we do to just gather here freely, openly, publicly. We don't know how much longer those rights will remain, Lord, so may we be strengthened in our faith if, if per- perchance we might live in a day where our, our very lives could be in danger because of the gospel. And may we take to heart these things that Paul writes here, and may we consider the final counsel of a dying man, and may we, Lord, open up our hearts to what you would want to say to us by your Holy Spirit. I thank you for all those who are here tonight and those who are watching online. We commit it all to you and for your glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 1, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, that word apostle is just one that means one sent out, uh, by the will of God, and he adds that often in his letters. It's similar to his other letters. He, he wants everybody to know this is not by the will of man or, or his own ambition, but God has called him by the will of God according to the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul will not use that phrase, the promise of life, in any of his other letters. But again, this is coming from the pen of a man who knows he's dying. And he, yet he's holding on to the promise of life because he knows that my own life on this earth might come to an end. But, you know, for the Christian, death is just graduation. For the Christian, death is graduation, where you are, you are moving from this world into eternity, and our, our bodies will decay again and return to the same 17 chemicals of dirt, elements of dirt from which we were created, but our spirit goes to be with the Lord because of what Christ has done for us, and we will be with Him forever. That's ultimate life. That's why Paul begins this letter knowing he's dying, saying, yeah, but I'm an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God according to the promise of life, the promise of life that is in Christ Jesus. And he writes to Timothy, verse 2, my dear son, now, again, it's Timothy's not his biological son. We covered this in 1 Timothy. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, in the intro of 1 Timothy, he calls Timothy, my son in the faith. And that's the idea here. Paul is a spiritual mentor to Timothy. He's not a biological dad. He's a spiritual dad. It's good to have a spiritual dad or a spiritual mom, somebody who's older in the faith you can look up to, learn from. Paul was that kind of a person for Timothy. And he says, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. He says in verse 3, I thank God whom I serve as my forefathers did with a clear conscience. And remember in 1 Timothy, Paul wrote about conscience over and over again. Like eight times he talked about conscience. Um, and, you know, it's just something that was important to him. It's, it's not just about how we live our lives in full view of people. It is how we live our lives when no one is watching. And that he would have a clear conscience is something that all of us should strive to have because we're not doing anything publicly or privately that would be inconsistent with our walk. But our belief is consistent with our behavior. That's why Paul says, I got a clear conscience. I'm one writing with a clear conscience. And he says in the rest of verse 3, as night and day, he says to Timothy, I constantly remember you in my prayers. You know, Paul was a praying man. And, you know, no doubt his conditions there of being in prison and having nothing else to do is, is you know, clearly a, a self-motivator for prayer. But he's a praying man. He's praying for Timothy. And he says in verse 4, recalling your tears, he says, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. You know, Paul, like any of us, uh, get joy from being close with friends and family. And Timothy was like family to him. And he's like, you know, it would bring me great joy to see you. And he recalls Timothy's tears. So apparently the last time 
Paul left, you know, Timothy wept. Now, we don't know, you know, maybe Timothy's tears were, I'm going to miss you. I don't know if I'll ever see you again. That would be expected. But Timothy, you know, who knows what's going on in Timothy's heart? Because when you put together 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, uh, we're going to see here in a minute where Paul addresses Timothy's fear. Timothy's got some fears. He's got some timidity. And in 1 Timothy, Paul talks about how, you know, take a little wine for your stomach. So he's got some physical ailments. And also here in 2 Timothy, Paul's going to tell Timothy, don't be ashamed to testify about the Lord. And so you put all these together. It's like the picture of Timothy, you know, Pastor Timothy, he's a little afraid. He, you know, he's got some, he's sickly. And sometimes he's ashamed and embarrassed about the gospel. So, you know, maybe he's crying because he's like, I don't want to do this anymore. I don't know what the reason for his tears are, but Paul remembers them. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. In verse 5, he says, I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Now, I love this verse because it is a reminder to us of godly heritage. And in particular, the godly heritage often that comes through women. Paul commends Timothy's mother, Lois, and his grandmother, Eunice. And we know from Acts chapter 16, when Paul, when Paul first encounters a young Timothy, Timothy's about 15 years of age when they first meet uh, in Acts chapter 16 as part of Paul's missionary journey. First encounters Timothy, and in Acts 16, it tells us that Timothy's mother was Jewish, which means Timothy's grandmother was also Jewish, but that Timothy's dad was a Greek and not a believer. And so Timothy came to faith because of a believing, a Jewish believing mother and a Jewish believing grandmother. Now, why do I say Jewish believing? Because, you know, Jews who believe in Jesus as Messiah are believing Jews. And so, um, and many Jews are coming to faith in Christ, uh, even as we speak. And God has been doing a wonderful thing to move in the hearts of Jewish people to recognize Jesus as Messiah. Uh, you know, when, when we go to Israel, uh, my, my, the tour guide that I've developed friends with now for 20 years is Ronnie Cohen. And Ronnie's testimony as a Jew is, you know, I came to faith because I, in doing these tours, I saw the love of Christians. And of course, he kept hearing Bible studies at every stop, you know, along the, along the way that pastors would teach. But his own testimony is, as a Jew, I came to faith in Jesus because I saw a tangible love that I had not seen anywhere else. And so, there are, and so as Jews come to faith in Christ too, just like Gentiles come to faith in Christ, and by the way, you don't stop being Jewish just because you believe in, in Jesus. Timothy here has this heritage that is handed down to him from his mom and from his grandmother who are both Jewish and believers in Jesus, and he's the, the beneficiary, he's the recipient of their influence. Let me just suggest this to you. First of all, this goes two ways. Number one, how many of you are thankful for either a praying mom or a praying grandmother in your life. Let me see your hands. Amen. Look at, look at all the hands here. Praise God. Now, it goes the other direction too. And, and not to leave the guys out, but just in the context of appreciating the women in the story, don't ever underestimate if you're a grandmother or a mom, again, grandfather and dad too, don't ever underestimate the power of your prayers for your kids and for your grandkids. Because when you saw the hands that just went up a minute ago, that is the fruit of some praying mom or praying grandmother. And you, by the work of God's Spirit in the hearts of your children and grandchildren, can have equal influence, even if you may not necessarily see the fruit immediately. Don't stop praying. Don't stop reading your Bibles with your kids and your grandkids. Don't stop being that godly influence, because here we are 2,000 years later, just about, reading the story about a, 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 an apostle who writes to a pastor who got saved because of a praying godly mother and grandmother. Amen. And he says, I'm persuaded now, this faith now lives in you because of your, 
uh, grandmother, I think I, I reversed their names a moment ago, because of your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, I am persuaded now lives in you also. And he says in verse 6, for this reason I remind you to fan and to flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, uh, I want to share with you, just in our time remaining, five directives that Paul specifically says to Timothy here in this first chapter. I mean, the, these are… Um, these are directives, exhortations, instructions that Paul uh, gives to Timothy that, that I want us to take personally ourselves. And the first thing that he says here in, in verse 6 is to fan into flame uh, the gift of God, the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Now, it's unknown exactly, specifically, what is Paul talking about here? Is he talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit in general? Because clearly in Acts 1 verse 4, Jesus even said before he ascended back into heaven, he said, wait for the gift that my Father promised, and he was speaking about the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Or is Paul speaking about a particular gift of the Holy Spirit? Because Paul mentions a list of gifts in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and there are other spiritual gifts mentioned in, in other passages of the New Testament. So, is he saying the gift of God, meaning the Holy Spirit in general? Is he saying a particular gift of the Holy Spirit? We, we don't really know. One thing we do know is that whatever he's talking about has gone dormant. Now, it's not necessarily that, you know, quote, he's lost it. Too many Christians get hung up on, I think I've lost it. I don't know that I have it anymore. You know, and, and we're so worried about what we've lost. Okay, don't, don't get wigged out about what you've lost, okay? He who began a good work in you is faithful to carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God is a keeping God. So don't, don't get all wigged out. I think I've lost something. If you even have the awareness of that question and wonder that, then you probably haven't. So don't, don't, don't fret over it. But there, there is, though, the reality that some things that God gives us can lie dormant. Some things that God gives us, particularly, for example, in, in the area of a particular gift, we don't use it. It can, it can grow dormant. Um, the power of the Holy Spirit can just lie dormant. We're not really pressing into the Lord. We're not really seeking Him. We're not really growing. And so, you know, there's a difference between the residence of the Holy Spirit and the power of the Holy Spirit in, in a person's life. The Holy Spirit, you know, when you receive the Lord Jesus, the, the Trinity is not separated. So when you come to faith in Christ, you get Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But you, many of you have heard this. There's a difference between you getting the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit getting you. And, and there is a transforming, baptizing, powerful work of God's Spirit that we also see in Scripture that is, that is this overflowing work of God's Spirit that is the empowering of God's people. And the word power, in fact, he's going he's to use the word power here. In, in the book of Acts, when you turn from the Gospels to the book of Acts, the emphasis is now the Acts of the Apostles because what they do under the inspiration and power of the Holy Spirit is, is amazing as a testimony of God's power, and the word love doesn't appear a single time in the book of Acts. The new word now is power, dunamis in the Greek, and we get our English word dynamite. And so, there, it's possible, it's possible to have the Holy Spirit because you're saved, but not have the, that power, that dunamis, that overflowing work of God's Spirit in your life. So, if it's the Holy Spirit in general or a particular gift, the exhortation here is whatever's dormant, Timothy, and this might be true for some of us, fan it into flame. You know, b blow on those embers and get that flame roaring again, Paul says, because I laid hands on you, and I, I remember how on fire you were, and right now there just seems to be the glow of the embers. But I'm calling you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. There sometimes can be a fire that burns in our belly when we first get saved, and then life takes its toll, and the world starts to, you know, pull us in its direction, and we can kind of grow lazy in our walk with Christ, and all of a sudden what used to be on fire is now just glowing embers. And so this exhortation might apply to some of us here tonight. Fan into flame the gift of God which is in you through the laying on of my hands. Verse 7, for God did not give us a spirit of timidity, King James, New King James, a spirit of fear, but a, a spirit of 
power, there's that dunamis word, power, and of love, and self-discipline. Again, King James, New King James says, um, instead of self-discipline, says sound mind. The Greek word is uh, sophronismos, and it can mean a calm, disciplined mind. Um, and so that contrasts verse 6, uh, the first part of verse 7 contrasts with the last part of verse 7. He says, you know, we're not to walk around in fear or timidity. We're to have the power of the Holy Spirit, and love is the evidence of that power of the Holy Spirit, and self-discipline, like, a, like a, just a calm, disciplined mind. That's a great verse. If you ever are wrestling with fear, anxiety, I quoted this a couple Sundays ago when we talked in Isaiah about don't be afraid. This is a great verse to underline or highlight in your Bibles that God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind or self-discipline. So, verse 8, here's the, second, here's the second directive. So, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me, his prisoner. So, that's the second directive that he says here, do not be ashamed. And again, the inference is, the inference is that, he's, that he's ashamed. You know, Paul's not going to exhort him about something that doesn't apply. So, the indication to us is that Timothy is wrestling with being ashamed a little bit, embarrassed a little bit. Now, you know, let's not point fingers at Timothy, even though he He's a pastor in Ephesus here. All of us can wrestle with this. But understand particularly why Timothy may have wrestled with this. He's getting a letter from a guy who's in prison, being persecuted and soon to be executed for his faith. You're living in first century Rome under the persecution of Emperor Nero, you aren't going to be probably as bold and courageous about your faith because you know you might end up in prison too or worse, executed as well. Now, this is very challenging for us because here we are, first century, comfort of Loudoun County in the good old United States of America, and nobody really being persecuted for his or her faith. And Paul says to Timothy, because Timothy's living in a day when you're being killed for your faith, I don't want you to be ashamed. I don't want you to be ashamed. Don't be ashamed to testify about our Lord. Don't be ashamed to testify about our Lord. And if Timothy is being exhorted in first century where his very life is potentially in danger, what business do we have being ashamed of the gospel? What business do we have? And Paul, Paul will write on this word ashamed five times in four chapters here. Five times. Now, we, we just read the word twice right here in verse 8. So, do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord or ashamed of me as prisoner. I'll point out the other ones. Jump further down to verse 18. May the Lord show mercy to the household of Ornesiphorus because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. Uh, Also in verse, chapter 2, verse 13. Sorry, uh, chapter 2, okay, twice in verse 8, once in verse 12, also verse 16, chapter 1, verse 16. And chapter 1, verse 12. Okay, I skipped verse 12. Sorry. In verse 12, that is why I am suffering as I am, yet I am not ashamed because uh, I know whom I have believed. And then in verse 16, and then also in chapter 2 and verse 15 in chapter 2, where he says, uh, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a workman who does not need to be ashamed. So five times, I just confused you. So twice in verse 8 of chapter 1, once in verse 12 once in verse 16, and then once in chapter 2, verse 15. So, five times he harps on this, don't be ashamed, don't be ashamed, don't be ashamed, don't be ashamed. And this is important for us to take to heart, because why should we be ashamed? And Paul will emphasize this also in his letter to the Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 16, where he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, For it is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Is this challenging to any of us? You know, what's the 
What's the worst thing that could happen in Timothy's day? His head could be cut off. What's the worst thing that could happen in our day? Your friends won't like you. They'll unfriend you. (laughs) That's so harsh, right? Do we need sometimes some perspective? I mean, what what is holding you back from being bold and courageous about your faith? Because your life's not in danger. So when I see Paul challenging us today because of the way he's challenging Timothy, I mean, this, this just hits me hard. Does it hit anyone else as hard? She's like, why, why, why are we timid about this? You know, I, I was a while, a while ago, this is actually a few years ago, I was sitting in a barber's chair getting a haircut, and the guy, and I'd never been to this guy before, and he's cutting my hair, and you know, he, and I'm just sitting in this chair, and he's just cutting away, and as he's, and as he's, and he's just cutting my hair, you know, he's, he's, he's just cussing. I mean, he's just being who he is, right? He's just cussing up a storm, you know, every other word. Just, you know, he's just like, just talking, he's just cutting my hair. And then after he's, you know, dropped the F-bombs and, and a whole bunch of other words just in conversation, then he goes, so what do you do? <laughs> and at the moment, you know, honestly, I wasn't ashamed of Jesus Christ, but I thought if, if I tell him what I do, he's going to feel embarrassed. He's going to feel embarrassed. So, you know, because he's just been dropping all these words. So I'm like, well, uh, I'm a pastor. And he goes, no crap. But it wasn't crap. (laughs) And then he goes, I'm a Christian too. (laughs) So I thought maybe a Lutheran. But, you know, anyway, I'm just. (laughs) So, um, but. You ever gotten in those conversations where you're like, okay, you know, how's this going to come across? And, and, you know, and so I, un- I understand because, you know, Jesus, just the word Jesus can be a lightning rod now. And, and you start talking about Jesus, you will either have revival or you'll have a riot. You know, where you work, you start throwing around the name Jesus and you're going to get a memo from somebody. You know, this offends me. You know, you're not protecting my space. You know, I don't... <laughs> I really don't prefer, you, you know, you bring religion into the workplace. And so, you know, if you could just please be mindful that we also observe and appreciate Hare Krishna and, and other forms of religious expression. And can't we all get along and, you know, and put on the bumper stickers on our cars that show that we're all just one faith with all the symbols that are mixed together. <laughs> so that we're all just... And so it's just like, you know, do you even want to tread into that and just, and it just becomes like painful, okay? And, and yet, and yet, re- read what Paul's saying here. The guy's in prison, he's about ready to be executed, and he says to Timothy, I know a bunch of Christians are being killed, but I don't want you to be ashamed about testifying about our Lord. And I don't want you to be ashamed about, you know, being associated with me as a prisoner either. You know, how, how quick are we to like cozy up to, uh, you know, if, if we run into contact with some celebrity or some superstar, you know, just like, did you see who I just ran into at the mall? Just let me show you my picture here. Who I just, uh, could you believe this? I took a facey with this, you know, and so we're like, oh, wow, I want to be a, a selfie, sorry. Selfie, <laughs> facey. That's, that's really what it should be called. It's a facey because that's all it is, you know. It's your face and this person's face. and it, but, but then, but, you know, God forbid you should be associated with like Jesus, you know, I don't want to, I don't want anybody to know I'm associated with Jesus, you know, and that, I don't want to have any picture of him on my cell phone, but it's just, this is just ha- challenging to me, like this, this is the world in which Timothy is living, and Paul's saying that don't be ashamed, in fact, now look on to the next part of verse 8, because this is directive number 3, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God who has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. That's number three on our list. Join in suffering for the gospel. And he's going to use the word suffering four times. And I won't read each time, but I'll give you the reference. Right here in verse 8, further down in verse 12, Chapter 2, verse 9, and chapter 3, 11. I'll say them again for you note takers. Right here, chapter 1, verse 8, chapter 1, 12, chapter 2, 9, and chapter 3, 11. He's going to talk about suffering through this letter. And again, it's kind of foreign to us because we just, we don't, 
really understand what suffering is all about. How many of you have either heard of or have in your possession Fox's Book of Martyrs? Um, I would encourage you to, to pick up this book. I'm sure you can get it on Amazon. You can get everything on Amazon these days. Um, because this gives a healthy perspective of this, this book. Now, this, I got this book probably 10 years ago. And uh, this, this actually was an edition put out by Voice of the Martyrs that documented um, not all, but many martyrs from 33 AD to today. This whole book is just like one paragraph or two paragraphs on various people who have been martyred. And we're not talking like, you know, they were, you know, left in a prison somewhere to starve. Uh, we're, we're talking about people, I'm just going to, I just threw in some tabs here to give you some examples. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch, he was a Christian who uh, lived A.D. 30 to around A.D. 107. He was torn to pieces by wild beasts. They fed him to beasts. That's how he was martyred. I'm just going to give you a couple here. I mean, this whole book is, um, this is an old sketch. I know you can't see it, but this is an old sketch um, about William Tyndale, who was burned at the stake. Why? For translating the Bible into the English language. William Tyndale, burned at the stake for translating the Bible into English. Um, John Bradford, burned at the stake. John Bradford, 1510 to 1555. This whole book just brings it all up to date. Nicholas Ridley, Hugh Latimer in the 1500s. Um, they were burned together in one fire at the stake. Edmund Campion was hanged, drawn, and quartered. And, and this, is, this is when they will uh, tie all four of your limbs to four different horses and then send the horses in different directions. Um, Theophane Venard, imprisoned and beheaded in Tonkin, which is Vietnam. All the way up to, you know, more current people, um, Gorbendor de Turani, November 22nd, 2005, was knifed by Muslims in Iran, all, all for their faith. I mean, this entire book is just a paragraph after paragraph after paragraph of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, now multiple tens of thousands of people who have been martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. So. Again, it's, it's perspective. It's easy for us to read this verse and say, oh yeah, join me in suffering. But when, he, when Paul's talking about suffering in first century, he, he means suffering. He means like, Timothy, if your life is required of you, like mine probably is going to be, for the cause of the gospel, so be it. Because God, verse 9 again, because God has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we've done, right? None of us have done anything to deserve God's favor, but because of His own purpose and His grace. God initiated it. God sought us. God bought us with the redeeming blood of His Son. And He adds in verse 9, this grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Before the beginning of time. Now, remember, God is outside the time-space continuum. So, the, God inserted time into the universe to bring definition and arrangement to our world. But God is not restricted by time. He's outside of time. And the Bible speaks in, in these terms in other places as well. Uh, back in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, Paul says, For he, the Lord, chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. How would we be chosen before the creation of the world? In Revelation chapter 13 and verse 8, it talks about, John says that the Lamb was slain 
from the creation of the world. So wait, Jesus was crucified. I thought he was crucified around 32 AD. What do you, what do you mean, John, in Revelation 13, 8, that he was crucified from the creation of the world? What does it mean in Ephesians 1 that we were chosen in him before the creation of the world? What does it mean here that we have received his grace before the beginning of time? Because God is not restricted by time and his purposes are outside of time. So God put in motion a purpose and plan to redeem us even before the beginning of our calculated time. This is not also that far-fetched because in 1 John, it tells us in 1 John 1, 5, that God is light and in him is no darkness. Einstein said that if we could travel at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, Einstein said if we could travel at the speed of light, time ceases to be. God is light. If we could travel at the speed of light, time ceases to be. At least he understood what that is. But it's the concept that God is light. God is outside of time. God is not restricted. This is a, a, a bit challenging to grasp in our minds. Those of you who are really smart with quantum physics and all this kind of stuff, you, you probably grasp this far better than I do. But when you piece together the elements of Scripture, which, which talk about what I just quoted, that we're chosen in him before the creation of the world, Jesus was slain uh, at the creation of the world, his grace is given to us before the beginning of time, that because God is outside of time and space, it is believed, I won't be surprised by this, that when you die, if you're a Christian and you go to heaven, even if your loved one died 50 years before you, that at the time you enter heaven, it will be simultaneous with your loved one. That there will be no distinction. Nobody in heaven is going to be, wow, this took a long time for you to get here. It's, it's as if things are happening at the rapid speed of light outside of time and space. And so we transcend something. I know this is getting like, woo, -hoo, but there seems to be this, this, this reality that is beyond our comprehension because we are limited within time and space. God is outside of time and space. And when you read this kind of language and, and you put together God is light and Einstein, what do you, you know, all of this begins to make us aware of the fact that there's, there's a greater dynamic and dimension to life than just here and now within the confines of time. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, verse 10, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death, okay, not, not that none of us no longer die, but that the stronghold of death, we die, we, our body goes back to dust, but our spirit goes to be with the Lord, so he destroyed the power of death and has brought life and immortality, because that's what we have in the Lord. We go to be with him forever. Life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald, one who proclaims, and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. There he uses that word again, suffering. Yet I am not ashamed, there's that word again, because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he, that's the whom, Jesus, is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day, that day being the day that I stand before him. Now, please notice, he, he doesn't say there in verse 12, I know what I have believed. He says, I know whom I have believed. It is important to know the who because you have to know the who in order to know the what. And if you don't know the who, you won't get the what right. There are a lot of people who know what, but they don't know who, and therefore what is wrong. There are a lot of Mormons who will say to you, I know what, but they don't know who. Because Mormons believe that Jesus is the spirit brother of Lucifer. That's not who. So now the what is an error, because the who is an error. You understand how this works? When Jehovah's Witnesses knock on your door and they talk about Jesus, well, to them, Jesus is the Archangel Michael. So they don't know the who, so therefore the what is an error. You understand? So Paul is saying the foundation of knowing what is first knowing whom I have believed. I know the Lord, I know who he is, therefore I know the what. But he adds the what in the next verse, verse 13. Because here comes another directive to Timothy. What you heard from me, that's the what part, the doctrine that flows from knowing the who, Jesus. What you heard from me, here's 
the fourth directive, keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. So that's the fourth thing on the list. Keep the pattern of sound teaching. Don't go off into error. Make sure that you understand what is true doctrine because you know the truth of God's Word. Get in your Bibles, read your Bibles, learn them, grow in your knowledge of Scripture. Keep that pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Verse 14, here's the last directive. Verse 14, guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. He's talking about, you know, your faith. Just guard it, protect it. It's, it should be a cherished thing. And, and protect and guard with the help of the Holy Spirit. Again, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. We're not alone in this guarding. God helps us to guard our faith. And he says in verse uh, 13, uh, 15, you know that everyone in the province of Asia has deserted me. How sad is that? Including, and he, and he calls out two guys, uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes. This is the only time they're mentioned in all the Bible. We don't know anything else about these guys, but how would you like to have your name in the Bible only for the purpose of des describing how unfaithful that you are? So that's their lasting legacy, those two guys. And Paul says in verse 16, may the Lord show mercy to the household of Ernesiphorus. He'll mention him again at the end, because he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. We don't know anything else about this guy either, but he commends him. He says, on the contrary, when he was in Rome, he searched hard for me until he found me. And may the Lord grant that he will find mercy from the Lord on that day. And you know very well in how many ways he helped me in Ephesus. A lot to meditate on. We'll pause there for tonight. Our time has escaped us anyway, and we'll pick it up there with chapter 2. So read ahead, because Paul compares the Christian life to three careers, a soldier, an athlete, and a farmer. So that'll be next week. But let's pray for tonight. Lord, we thank you for this time together. And as we just go home this evening, may chapter one just continue to resonate in our hearts, especially the part about not being ashamed. Lord, wherever we go, may we be bold and courageous about testifying to Jesus in our lives. And we trust you with how people would receive that. We just want to be faithful to never be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Forgive us, Lord, when we have pulled back, when we've said less than we should. May we never be ashamed when we think about how Timothy's life was in danger, and yet Paul said to him, don't be ashamed. Even perhaps be prepared for suffering. What kind of suffering do we go through, Lord? We, we don't. It's, it's, it's easy and comfortable for us. So all the more reason why we should never be ashamed of magnifying Jesus in our lives by the way we live and by what we say. May people see and hear the testimony of Jesus in our lives. And we thank you, Lord, for your grace that was given to us before the beginning of time, revealed to us in these last days, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Amen.